I want to spend today's session reading a good portion of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You know what I love about 1 Corinthians is that every time you want to just like pull a little section out, it uses words like However, I, or therefore, I, or, but God has, like, you have to keep going back. You have to read the full context of the verse. You're going to hear my, you're going to hear my, uh, my pages turning while I read this to you. But I want to start in 1 Corinthians 2. This whole chapter is so beautiful and The chapter starts with Paul acknowledging that his own skill um, can can sometimes actually get in the way of God showing his greatness and that God will use our weakness to show his greatness. Um, Let's read this. So Paul is speaking. He says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Verse 3, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God." Verse 6, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Verse 9, but as it is written, Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. We get to this beautiful, beautiful section, verse 10 through verse, well, really till the end of the chapter. So this section is so, we'll we'll talk about all of this, but I want to read it all together for you. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man, except the spirit of the man, which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. That section is very wordy, by the way. I have a hard time reading it. But really what he's saying is, We don't know the things of God. God knows the things of God. (laughs) Verse 13, these things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For he who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. This last section is so profound because God is essentially saying, we have the mind of Christ. Because the Spirit is in us, because the Holy Spirit is in us, because we are saved, born again, believers of Jesus Christ, having a personal relationship with him through the redemption of our sins, through the gift of Jesus Christ, we have the mind of Christ. Now, I was sharing this with my friend this morning because I just was studying this yesterday and I wrote in my Bible kind of next to that end part. This, this is a gift. Do we value this? Do we really get what we've been given? Um, I don't think we do. You know, a lot of what we've been talking about here on the channel through this series comes back to identity, right? And all of the things that we as young women struggle with 
come down to our identity, how we see ourselves, why we see ourselves that way, and who says, right? Who is the influential source that is impacting and in in a lot of ways controlling how we think what we think, how we believe what we believe. And that's either going to be the one true God who has the authority and the worthiness to, and the position, right? He has the position to inform us because he is the creator of us. Um. But oftentimes, we're looking to sources that change often, our own beliefs, our own decisions based on what we think and feel and want, or other people and what other people are determining um, we should be like or shouldn't be like or whatever that is, right? So there's all of these factors around us that can absolutely influence how we think what we think, how we feel what we feel, and, and to the core, how we believe what we believe um, and who says, right? That's always going to be a question that I ask. Who says? Like when someone makes a statement, who says? Why is that true? Because we can say that something is true, but we got to know where it's coming from. Who says? What's the source? Any good court system upholding righteousness, upholding justice is always going to come back to truth has to be based on a source. If you say something is a fact, then you have to find evidence to back up that thing being true. And what's beautiful is the Bible is the source of truth. God is the creator of the universe. He created all things. He is the epitome of truth because he created all things that are. He created you. He created me. We are the image of the invisible God. We are his creation, his likeness. We are purposeful on this planet, on earth, to do the will of God, to glorify him in all things. None of that is out there. That is a personal mandate that he has given us, a privilege to be more and more like him. But I think the piece that we often miss is this last verse. We have the mind of Christ. You may not feel like you have the mind of Christ. I often do not feel like I have the mind of Christ. I often don't feel like I will ever have the mind of Christ. But the reality is We do have the mind of Christ because we have the Holy Spirit in us. The moment we were saved, we had the Holy Spirit in us. And the work that the Holy Spirit is doing inside of us requires a willing mind, a willing heart, a willing body to love Christ more than our fleshly desires, to love Christ more than our comfort and our pleasure to love him more than all of that so that when blessing comes, we are grateful to God. And when suffering comes, we are grateful to the opportunity that God has given us to grow, to be resilient, to be spiritually deep, right? To have some depth and some some meat on our bones spiritually. All good gifts are from God. And even the things that we don't see as necessarily good are indeed good because they give us the opportunity to be more and more like Christ in all things. Jesus is such a great example, right? Because he came on earth, he experienced the hardest, most difficult things that human beings will ever experience. He knows, not just from an intellectual, I created all things sort of way, but from an experiential perspective. He knows what it's like to feel pain. He knows what it's like to feel loss. He knows what it's like to feel like he is the absolute, he, he's alone in all things because he actually was. You know, how many times do you feel alone even though you're not alone? He actually was alone. He knows what it feels like to be alone, um, to have his father's eyes turned away at the cross and to take all of the sin and all of the punishment and all of the destruction of humanity on upon himself. He knows what that feels like. 
And so we can lean on him. We can trust him knowing that he knows what we feel and he has compassion and love for that. And he also is saying, there is purpose. There is meaning. There is a reason. And you don't need to know the nitty gritty reasons for the particular pain that you're going through. Focus on me. Focus on Christ. Focus on the God who created you. Um, Do all things with joy and an anticipation that we are becoming more and more like him. We should want to, we should desire to be more like him in all things. Now, how does this have that, that weaving thread, that connection to confidence and identity and all of these things? And, and really what I would say is like, when you look around in the world, you can may look at your own life, you may look at others. When you look around in the world, you may see, like myself, a lot of people who identify as Christian, evangelical, etc., who are incredibly debilitatingly anxious, worried, stressed, frustrated, snippy, short. And in, in that observation, what, what I often see, even in myself in the many, many seasons that I have struggled with how I feel, letting my emotions run the show and inform my decisions and choices and priorities. One of the things that I'm constantly reminded of is where my anxious heart is shows where my priorities are. It shows what matters most to me. If I am anxious about my business, it shows where I'm worshiping. When I am worried and chronically frustrated about money, it shows where my most, where my, where my gold is, right? It shows what's most important to me. When I am stressed about losing friendships to stand up for my faith, it shows what matters most to me. The same is for you. Whatever you are most stressed and anxious and worried about reveals what matters most to you. And the reality is when we focus all of that energy that we're putting towards other things on Christ, we don't have to be worried and anxious. We can love and care to be more and more like him and to obey him in all things. And that actually brings peace and fulfillment, not stress and worry. That actually brings excitement and joy and a, a, a sustainable sort of contentment that chasing the business, chasing the money, chasing the friends doesn't produce. Because as, as creation – not the creator, but as the creator's creation, we are designed to worship and to glorify and magnify our creator, not creation. It's like using a baseball bat as like using a baseball bat to try to mow the lawn. It's not going to work. It doesn't function that way because it wasn't designed for it. If you want to know what a baseball bat is for, you got to study the creation of baseball. You've got to study what baseball is about and what what the functions are and who designed it and what they say, right? And like, how do you know what baseball is really about? Well, you go back to who designed it, who created it, what are the rules, uh, what is the structure? And then you know how to use the tools within the game. And the same is true for our life here on earth. If we want to know what were we made for, then we've got to go to our creator who created us and say, what am I made for? What is the function? What are the rules? How do we play the game? What are the tools within the game? And the beautiful part is, I'm holding up my Bible right now. This is what we were made for. And this is, this Bible is our guidebook. It's our, it's our rule book um, for what it looks like to live more and more like Christ. We get example after example after example of people that God used that were fallen, that were sinful, that were not perfect, that chose to love God and be a part of the great adventure of his plan. Even though they felt inadequate, even though they had all of these weaknesses, in fact, those weaknesses were exactly what God used through his strength to be made known. And 1 Corinthians is such an example of this, this chapter, really the whole book. But this chapter is such an example of one, 
We don't have to be perfect. We don't have to be strong in all things. In fact, if anything, we need to focus more of our energy on who God is and wanting what he wants so that he can be made known in our weakness. And two, finally, we have the mind of Christ. Now we need to use it. Now we need to trust in him, in us, and be willing to actually let the mind of Christ come through in our decisions and our priorities and what we want most in the areas that we may feel easily anxious or distressed to pause and come back to who is God? Do I believe that he is who he says he is? That, my friend, will create a level of spiritual confidence that surpasses any human failure, earthly lack of success. You don't have to go build a multi-million dollar business to have confidence. You've got to come back to what does God say about me? What is my identity through him? What is his character? Is he is he who he says he is? And what has he promised so that I can totally lean and trust on him and my anxious heart can rest confidently knowing that God is who he says he is. And that is confidence. <laughs>